Doc Talk is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Hey folks, thanks for joining me today on the show. We're at Iowa State University and it's a pleasure because we're going to have Dr. Dan Loy on the show today. Dr. Loy is someone that I've considered to be a mentor, someone that I have followed my entire career and so to get him on the show is just a treat for me. We're going to talk about feedlot facilities, whether it's a hoop building, slatted floors, outdoor uh, open air facilities. We're going to talk about the work at the Iowa Beef Center that Dr. Dan and his staff are doing in the Department of Animal Science at Iowa State University. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life, it's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do. Every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Hello, I'm Dr. Frank Lyons from Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center here in Manhattan, Kansas. Daryl was one of our patients that we did about seven months ago. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore out my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this process, I thought if there's a way to get rid of this pain, then I, then I want to do it. So we did it and it worked. And I'm not going to go out and take trees with a shovel anymore, but then I can do the things that I want to do now. Well, it's been very gratifying to help people with their painful joints and other uh, entities and it's been especially gratifying to be able to help people who I know and have worked with and known for many years. Closed captioning brought to you by Vet Gun with Amel and new AMA Abamectin Vet Caps, the one-two punch against horn fly resistance from AgriLabs. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Dan Loy, who is a professor and the director of the Iowa Beef Center here at Iowa State University in the Department of Animal Science, and someone that I have uh, used a lot of your research um, followed some of your research yeah. in my PhD from what you did in your PhD yeah. and so it's an honor for me to have you here and, and spend some time with us. Thank you very much. Really happy to be here. Great. Yeah. And we're going to talk about because I, probably if you have an opportunity go to the Iowa Beef Center on the on the web because I would say it's probably the best resource on on beef cattle out there for education, uh, outreach and things of that nature to help you with your with your operation, but the one that really caught my eye that y'all did so well was was on feedlot facilities. Right. That is a tremendous document. Right. It's a document, we call it our feedlot systems manual, and I think it was last updated in 2016 or 2017, but I think all the information in there is still applicable. We got a companion spreadsheet that you can plug in your own numbers and, and really look at some of the details. Really yeah, you, you need to go onto the website and, and, and look. But, you know, when we talk about different housing systems for feedlot cattle, you know, what kind of jumps to your mind to begin with? Well, one of the first things is really trying to mitigate some of the challenges that we have environmentally, especially up here in the upper Midwest. We have them all. 
We have cold stress. We have heat stress. We have a lot of precipitation this year, a lot record amounts of precipitation, which uh, translate into issue, potential issues related to mud. And so we need, uh, we need to have strategies to deal with all of those in different situations. Yeah, and we had it this year, you know, in places like Southwest Kansas. And yeah. That like we, since everybody started talking about 93 again, and, and right. uh, um, it was worse. Right. It was, it was worse. And, you know, we're, we're used to cold stress in, in the upper Midwest, and that's why uh, shelter is a very popular option. A lot of our feedlots, even if they're an open feedlot, they have a barn, uh, that, you know, 20 square feet or so that the cattle can get into, and that serves uh, a lot of uh, mitigation for heat stress or cold stress, but also it provides shade for heat stress as well. You bet. And so when when... You know, when I look at the beef industry and I think about that, you know, probably the two things we battle the most in feedlots when it comes to animal welfare is is mud and, yeah. and heat stress. Yes. Those are yes. the two booger bears that yeah. that come after us. Mud and heat stress. And, and uh, there's different mitigations for heat stress. Shade is probably the number one option. And, of course, the shelter can, can work towards that. In terms of mud, we can deal with slope in the feedlot, uh, square footage per head, and concrete. Those are, our, those are our three main strategies, and there's different approaches to, to managing those. We're seeing a lot more concrete going in. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And it, we, we've seen that historically in Iowa, especially as you go east across the state where we get more rainfall, you see feedlots will use more concrete just to manage the potential mud. Yeah, well, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the different structures and things that we're seeing in the state of Iowa and beyond. You're watching Doc Talk from Iowa State University, here with Dan Loy, more after these messages. Hey folks, Dr. Dan here. Welcome to our Cattle First Tip, as sponsored by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica. Vet Medica. And today we're gonna to talk about pin floor conditions. Now, when I think about pin floor conditions in confinement, I'm thinking about one of two things. I'm thinking about too muddy or too hot. And specifically, when we talk about mud, we wanna be able to control mud. We wanna give cattle, we may not be able to control rain and control all the mud, but through building mounds and through making proper ways for water to escape the pins, we can make sure that these pins drain well and we can make sure that cattle have a dry place to lay down and that they don't have to wade through mud to get to the feed bunk or the water tank or the place that they're going to bed. When it's 97 degrees outside, the pin floor is 137 degrees. So providing some sort of, of bedding, which is straw, even when pin floors are too hot, can provide comfort for calves to lay down and give them a cooler spot. We don't want pins too muddy. We don't want the pin floors too hot. This is your Cattle First Tip. Join us for the 15th annual Fall Bull Sale at Gardner Angus Ranch, Monday, September 30th at 9 a.m. Featuring approximately 450 registered bulls, 160 registered females, including 35 cows and 125 heifers, and 300 bred commercial females. These are elite herd sire prospects and rank in the top percentiles of the Angus breed for calving ease, growth, and end product merit. Catalog will be available at GardnerAngus.com. Register for online bidding at LiveAuction.tv. It's business as usual producing value-added seed stock that provides opportunities for profitability regardless of our customer's chosen marketing endpoint. See you in September at the ranch. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Dan Loy, who's a professor and the director of the Iowa Beef Center here at Iowa State University. And, and you know, different structures, different, I mean, we're really seeing some 
changes in things going in, but still some of the old staples. Right, yeah, there's some, some changes. There's also some misperceptions out there. We're seeing a lot of popularity for um, more confined buildings, total confinement, whether it's a deep bedded type of facility or a slatted floor facility. But still a survey we did, and it's, you know, it's three years ago now, 75% um, of the lots in Iowa are still open feed lots. Now they may have a shelter, they may have, uh, and they may have a lot of concrete, especially as we go in the eastern part of the state but still the majority of our feedlots are, are open lots. Now, that being said, about half of the new construction in the five years prior to that survey were uh, confined buildings. And a lot of popularity in the deep bedded buildings where um, you know, uh, bedding is continually added uh, throughout the feeding period and then uh, maybe cleaned out in between groups and, and disinfected and so forth. Uh, and more recently, we've been seeing a lot of interest and popularity in the slatted floor buildings, which uh, has You don't have to clean some, as much. You don't have as it reduces the labor. You don't have to haul all the bedding in and bedding out in the form of manure. And then the other advantage to those is uh, slightly less labor and improved manure value, which is one of the huge advantages that a lot of producers are interested with with that uh, particular. Because a lot of people uh, farm and feed, or, or they may have neighbors that, that it's easier to get rid of the manure the more the higher the value. Of the exactly. You know, the, you start moving in the upper Midwest, you, you lose economies of scale because our feedlots are smaller but you have that integration with the farming system, which is their real advantage. So yep. that manure value reduces the cost of crop production, uh, which goes back into reducing the input costs in cattle, and it's kind of a kind of a cycle that a lot of producers like to take advantage of with the farm feedlot. We always talked about how we ship the used to sh well, we still do ship gluten and distillers down to the panhandle mm -hmm. to feed, and we mm -hmm. should be hauling the manure back in the trucks back to the fields that that corn comes <laughs> yeah. from to, to complete the cycle. Exactly. But, uh, uh, and so what, what are some of the, you say 50% of the, the new building or new lots are, are indoors. Do um, you think that trend will continue? Um, there's a lot of, that's a good question. I, I think there's potential for it to continue. There's no question that those confined buildings are more costly to build. Uh, so it's imperative that they get that m advantage back and from a manure, uh, manure management standpoint. So a lot of it has to do with the value of manure, has to do with the cost of labor and availability labor, and uh, the economy of the beef industry in general as well. Yeah, we, we see it as well. And, and uh, obviously with some of these cattle prices and the outweights that we're seeing, uh, not a lot of expansion, um, but... Uh, right. But but as we change things within the industry, I think we'll see it again. Yeah. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Dr. Loy about some of the differences in these structures and, and facility arrangements. You're watching Doc Talk. Thanks for joining us. Your investment in the beef checkoff is opening new doors for beef today and tomorrow. Our commitment to long-term planning helps ensure your profitability from one generation to the next. Hello, this is uh, Caleb Plyler, Plyler and Son Charlays. This is my son, Hook, and my wife, Brianna. And we operate a uh, purebred Charlay operation in Hope, Arkansas. You know, in the uh, business that we're in, the beef checkoff dollars are very important to us. A lot of that money is to educate people just like kids uh, that's in Huck's class, the importance of eating beef. You know, it's a high-protein product that uh, it's a very important uh, part of our diet. Sometimes we get this uh, bad rap as uh, uh, beef is not uh, you know what we really need to be uh, doing from a dietary standpoint but uh, you know being able to get to the kids and let them know that you know beef it is what needs to be for dinner. You know one of the the bigger things with our family is uh, getting to go out and show off some of our cattle. Huck he gets to show uh, a lot of heifers. Uh. A lot of what we do trying to uh, get him into showing is the fact that it's teaching him discipline, respect for the animals and it's going to continue to uh, give him lifelong skills throughout his life. But I think it's very important that, uh, you know, the next generation understands how important uh, the beef industry is. Just like Huck here, we plan on him one day operating this farm. And, uh, you know, if, 
If we can do that, we're doing what we need to. Because, you know, this country is uh, founded upon people that, you know, have family traditions and, and do a really good job of keeping those traditions going. But one day, what kind of cows do you want to gr grow up to have, you think? Charlays. Charlays, all right. You know, uh, if the beef checkoff dollars are going to really good causes and really promoting beef, then uh, the consumers are going to want to want to buy more beef, and, and that uh, leads for us making more money in the end, and uh, and it really helps the quality of people's cow herds because we're able to enhance our genetics even more. When it comes to stopping horn flies, cattlemen love their vet gun. Today they love it even more because Vet Gun now has a one-two punch with two VetCap insecticides. New AIM A Abamectin can be used in rotation with AIM L for effective in-season control. Each delivers a unique mode of action to manage hornfly resistance. So start your in-season rotation program with AIM L and new AIM A Abamectin VetCaps from AgriLabs. When you're in the cattle business, no matter how much it's a business, it still starts with cattle. It's this basic notion that sits at the core of how we approach things at Beringer Engelheim. We understand when you put the cattle first, it just naturally leads to doing the right things. If you want to do well in this business, you start by doing right. Take care of the cattle, and they'll take care of you. You spent countless hours building a strong operation. But when it comes to trichomoniasis, the odds are stacked against you. It takes just one infected bull to take down the whole herd. Damage could include open cows, lost pregnancies, and lost profits. The good news is with Trick Guard, a herd doesn't have to feel like a house of cards. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Dan Loy. We're at Iowa State University where Dr. Loy is the director of the Iowa Beef Center and he's a professor of animal science and somebody that, that is a true leader in our industry and we're very thankful to have him on the show. When we talk about the, the facilities, you know, confinement, outdoor, open, open uh, arrangements, what are some of the things that you kind of go into your decision making mm -hmm. as, as far as a producer or, or nutritionist, veterinarian, when you're, when you're thinking about yeah. this? There's, there are some misperceptions out there about the differences between the p facilities. A lot of producers want to justify the additional expense in a facility based on the performance of the cattle. And if you look at, uh, well, if you go back and look at the long-term data comparing facilities, a lot of that goes back to the 70s and 80s research at Northwest Iowa and Southwest Minnesota. Um, it's hard to find differences depending on different types of facilities going from open lot to confinement. But what we do know is that in this region, the shelter will long-term, year-round, add about, improve efficiency about 5%. Okay. which is enough to justify a shelter, whether it's a shelter that's sitting in an open lot or a shelter that's a confined facility. Within that, there's not much difference though, however. And so, so we need to look at justifying it for other reasons. Now, that being said, what those facilities do is reduce the risk of that disaster. Right. You know, if we have a blizzard where we have absolutely terrible performance, then we're like this winter. Yep. We we got had better performance where we had a more confined situation. If we have that tremendous heat stress outbreak, if those cattle have access to shade, they're more like we're less likely to see those significant death losses that we'd see in an open lot without shade. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of an insurance policy. But long term, it's hard to justify it economically. So you're looking at cattle comfort, you're looking at the risk of the environment, but then you're also looking at the other factors that we talked about earlier, manure value, labor, and that type of thing. Yeah, and so when, when we talk about the, the manure, obviously there's more value in the, the slatted floor than the deep bed because of the amount of, of carbohydrate that's 
Well, the that. difference is in the, primarily in the nitrogen. Really? When uh, in an open feedlot, about 50% of the nitrogen is driven off into the environment as ammonia. In a deep bedded facility, you retain about 70% of the nitrogen. In, uh, in a deep slatted floor confinement, you retain virtually all of the nitrogen. Huh. So that difference in manure value is retained uh, right into the agronomic system. I'll be dang. Well, that is, that is, that, that's, that's not only good for, for the manure value, but also for, for the value of being able to put that nutrient uh, management plan together as a feed yard on where you're going to spread it. Exactly. Uh, manure management uh, also reduced um, carbon footprint as well. Yeah. Well, this, um, folks, a lot of things go into making a decision on these types of facilities. Obviously, they're huge capital investments. Um, but if you, if you want, go to the Iowa Beef Center, look up the, the feedlot systems uh, manual, manual mm -hmm. and, and take a look. It's all right there. Um, but when we come back, we'll talk a little more with Dr. Dan Loy here at Iowa State. Join us for the 15th annual Fall Bull Sale at Gardner Angus Ranch, Monday, September 30th at 9 a.m., featuring approximately 450 registered bulls, 160 registered females, including 35 cows and 125 heifers, and 300 bred commercial females. These are elite herd sire prospects and rank in the top percentiles of the Angus breed for calving ease, growth, and end product merit. Catalog will be available at GardnerAngus.com. Register for online bidding at LiveAuction.tv. It's business as usual producing value-added seed stock that provides opportunities for profitability regardless of our customer's chosen marketing endpoint. See you in September at the ranch. When it comes to stopping horn flies, cattlemen love their vet gun. Today they love it even more because vet gun now has a one-two punch with two vet cap insecticides. New AIM A abamectin can be used in rotation with AIM L for effective in season control. Each delivers a unique mode of action to manage horn fly resistance. So start your in season rotation program with AIM L and new AIM A abamectin vet caps from AgriLabs. No matter where, no matter why, the Veterinary Health Center at Kansas State University is committed to providing quality patient care to animals and exceptional customer service to their owners. From routine checkups to emergency and specialty care, our world-renowned specialists and experienced professionals are here to discover, to teach, and to heal. Let us know. How can I help? How can we help? Some call it a come from behind victory an unlikely win, a reversal of fortune, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. This is our moment, our victory dance, because we choose confidence. We choose Zuprivo for BRD treatment. Ask your veterinarian to prescribe Zuprivo. Zuprivo is a fast-acting, long-lasting BRD treatment that you can count on to get the job done. Choose confidence. Choose Zuprivo from Merck Animal Health. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council. Improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Dan Loy at Iowa State University. Dr. Dan is the director of the Iowa Beef Center here at Iowa State University and is a professor in animal science, a ruminant nutritionist, and has done a lot of work on looking at the comparison of these facilities and different types of facilities for feeding mm -hmm. cattle. And, and so as we, as we start to move forward on this, how, what's kind of something that would wrap this thing up? Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the costs that, we're, that we had in that, uh, in that particular publication and then what, how producers can use that to actually make decisions because every decision is a little bit different. But you know, one of the things I think that 
people find interesting, they open, uh, open it up, look at the costs. And these were based on surveys that were construction costs on the average at the time. Every building company is a little different. You know, if you're going to do part of the labor, you can reduce some of the costs. So there's a lot of variation there. But, you know, an open feedlot to build a brand new open feedlot was probably cost somewhere around 350 to $400 per headspace based on those costs at that time. If we move to a more confined facility like a deep bedded housing system, now we're in the $700 per head range. So we basically double the cost of construction. And then if we move to the slatted floor confinement, and we haven't talked about rubber mats, but we think that rubber mats uh, are something that we want to have there from a cattle comfort and in uh, uh, standpoint that adds about two hundred dollars so the total cost is going to be about eleven hundred that was our calculations so we need to look at justifying that additional difference based on either the longevity of the facility uh, the performance which I mentioned long term may not be a big factor but then that manure value and in, in the the reduction in manure value and reduction in other costs as well the the key point I think to take home from this is that those are just examples of costs, but I think we give a good background into how you might take a look at those costs, put your plug your own numbers into that, and then we have a companion spreadsheet where you can do that, plug in your own numbers and, and do some comparisons with different types of facilities. And I guess the, the one other thing I'd add that's happened in, in recent years, in you know the last four or five years, is that we've had a lot of uh, companies that have been developed that really can provide a lot of si assistance with these as well. A lot of really good companies that have redesigned their structures and have, um, have some good uh, uh, technical advice that they can give and there's producers out there with experience as well too. Sure and it seems like you know those types of people as, as we have more systems in place more people run into more issues and can translate that back and forth. That's right. Well, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for all that you do for all of us in the beef industry. We really appreciate it. We, um, he's one of the good guys. Um, so is he. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for being with us today. Remember, always work with your local veterinarian and nutritionist. Um, if you want to know what we do on Doc Talk, you can find us on the web at www.doctalktv.com. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Dan Loy from Iowa State University, and we'll see you down the road. Closed captioning brought to you by Vet Gun with AML and new AMA Abamectin Vet Caps, the one two punch against horn fly resistance from AgriLabs. For more information about this program or previous programs, go to DocTalkTV.com. Doc Talk was brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if your cattle get out, you could be held liable for that? Call me, let's have a discussion. 316-945-6733. You don't have to be a farmer or rancher to become a Kansas Farm Bureau member. Anyone can join. As a member, you'll get discounts on things like hotels and entertainment, health and wellness services, cell phone plans, and more. You'll also strengthen the lives of your fellow Kansans and help build strong, prosperous communities through agriculture advocacy and education. Join us today. Visit kfb.org join to learn more.